welcome to Pioneering Pensions. For those who don't know me, my name is Stefan Lundberg, and I have a passion for pension. Today's guest is no other than Mosh Milevsky, and he's going to talk with us about the challenges we have when looking at retirement through the traditional life cycle theory. We will also talk about how to implement on teens in practice. As usually, we're going to have a conversation for half an hour. After that, you in the audience can ask your questions and uh, we will go through them. And at the end, we will announce the next uh, speaker. Bush is very famous in the area of Tontines. He is a tenured professor of finance at uh, the York University in Canada. He has a PhD in finance, but also did a lot in math and statistics and physics as an undergrad. And he published 17 books, written 65 articles, and been in hundreds of magazines talking about pension and finance. What I really like with Mosh is he took time off and he re-educated himself by following a Master of Science in History at the University of Edinburgh. And he gra graduated in November 22 at age of 55. So you're never too old to go to school. He also is an active entrepreneur. He founded a fintech startup called Quema, and they did product allocation algorithms, and it was sold in 2013. And he's also worked as a consultant to the federal and the state US governments in various capacities over the years. So Mosh, he basically knows the ins and out of the theory and the practice. So with that, Mosh, welcome to Pioneering Pensions. Thank you, Stefan. It's a pleasure to uh, be here and I appreciate the opportunity to do this. So uh, thank you. My first question to you, Mosh, is that in previous episodes of Pioneering Pensions, uh, we talked with Sri Bodhi, and he mentioned how he and Merton took the life cycle theory of Friedman, Samuelson, and Modigliani, and extended that into life cycle investment theory. And this is now the framework for most people working in DC creating investment solutions. And the key aspect of that is human capital. And it's often assumed, and I think that's also what Bodhi and Merton did, that the human capital is a bond-like asset. And you wrote a book called, Are You a Stock or a Bond? So can you tell us a little bit more on your view on the human capital in this life cycle uh, theory? Yeah, I mean, first of all, Tzvi, uh, and I, you know, I consider him a good friend, uh, Tzvi and uh, Robert Merton and uh, Samuelson, the son of the famous Paul Samuelson, uh, wrote what I consider to be one of the most fundamental articles in uh, personal finance and wealth management. Uh, it was an article that they published in the uh, 1990s. And as you pointed out, uh, it made the argument that a person's job, uh, their career, what they do for a living, uh, should be considered a type of asset. And uh, that has to be added to the portfolio. So whereby traditional investment used to focus exclusively on the uh, financial part of your life, the financial part of your balance sheet, uh, they made the argument that especially early on in life, the vast majority of your wealth uh, is sitting in human capital, which is just the present value of all the uh, income that you're going to earn over the course of your life. And they then uh, extended that to portfolio theory. And they said, well, if you have this enormous asset, then that enormous asset is like a bond because, you know, you can predict that you're going to be earning this over the course of your life. That means that when you're younger, you can afford to take on a little bit more stock and uh, you can invest more aggressively. And as you pointed out, Stefan, that's sort of the basis of the, uh, you know, DC industry life cycle and even target date funds. You're, you're, you're younger, you have more equity. Uh, as you get older, you have less equity, which, of course, goes you know, against the argument that time is irrelevant in an asset allocation model. So that's been done. That was there. Uh, it's very important to give credit where credit is due in, in, in this business. And I think that Svi and uh, Robert Burton sort of set the stage for that. What I was trying to do is just to popularize the idea that uh, human capital, yes, it's the most valuable asset that you have, uh, but it has certain risk characteristics that really depend on what you do for a living. So if you are a tenured professor, 
uh, like Tzvi or Professor Merchant or like myself, I'm a tenured professor. Yeah, my human capital is very, very predictable and safe because, you know, it converts into a pension when I retire. It's very, very difficult to fire professors at a university. They have to be extraordinarily incompetent to get rid of them. So, I mean, that, that's a really safe asset. So, yes, treat it as a bond. But as my students tell me, uh, you know, we're no bonds, Professor Malevsky. Uh, we're going into the industry and we're going to work in, in the financial services industry. We're going to work in a gig economy where there's no job security. Uh, we're going to work as real estate agents. We're going to work as bond traders. We're not bonds, Professor Malevsky. What are we? And I said, well, you're probably more like stocks. And if that's the case, you might want to tilt your investment portfolio uh, more towards things that are safer because your human capital isn't. So that was sort of the, the source or the origin of what you had mentioned, the title, are you a stock or a bond? And the answer is that most people are neither. It's something in between. If what you do for a living is you're a real estate agent, and uh, up until recently, that was a very popular profession where I live up in Canada, uh, many, many real estate agents, I think too many, if you ask me, they were not bonds and they certainly were not stocks. They were basically REITs, real estate investment trusts. So I would have told them, don't invest your financial capital in REITs or you know residential real estate because that's what you do for a living. If you're a commodity trader, you work in the oil industry in Alberta, in Canada, uh, you know, make sure you don't have oil and gas in your investment portfolio. And the list goes on and on and on. Are you a stock or a bond is about getting people to think, what do you do for a living? What financial part or, or, or what sector of the economy, thinking in terms of S&P sectors, what sector of the economy are you? How do you make sure that your financial portfolio takes that into account? That, that's what the, the essence was of are you a stock or a bond? So basically, our, our human capital is probably the most important asset in our balance sheet. And how can we protect and grow it? And, you know, the young probably have another thing, but people who are reached age 55, uh, like you and me, we probably also should think about it like you did. So do you have any thoughts or advice in that space? So, so once you get through sort of the, the human capital 101, which is that that is the most valuable asset on your personal balance sheet, and, and probably uh, until your 50s, uh, I tell people it's like an iceberg. You know, with an iceberg, there's an enormous amount of ice underwater. You just see the tip. Uh, the vast majority of your wealth can't be seen. It's underwater. It's human capital. So then we talk not just about investments. We talk about insurance. So if human capital is so valuable, uh, you want to insure it. You want to make sure you have life insurance if your family depends on you for income. You definitely want to make sure you have disability insurance and critical illness insurance, let alone health insurance. So as we move through the life cycle, uh, it becomes a question of not just how do you balance your investment portfolio, how do you manage these risks within the context of uh, the life cycle and, and the things that you're trying to protect. So when you get to our age, uh, what we're thinking about is not just human capital anymore. We're now thinking about our financial capital because probably we have more financial capital than we have human capital. And at that point, we want to make sure that it is protected. So I like to think about insuring your financial capital versus your human capital. When you're young, you're insuring your human capital, life insurance, health insurance, disability insurance, critical illness insurance, let alone home insurance. And as you age and your human capital is being converted into financial capital, now it's start to, time to start thinking, hey, how am I protecting my financial capital against many risks, especially the risk of longevity, which is me living much, much longer than I anticipated, which of course gets right into your backyard of pensions, because pensions are a form of longevity insurance. In DC pension, a lot of the providers tend to de-risk, according to the theory, quite heavily towards retirement. And I think the argument there is like when you retire, you have no human capital left, or, or you will retire at a certain date and, and stay that way. But I think when I look at it, I'm thinking about, well, you're going to retire at age 67, 70, but you might going to live for 20, 30 years. Are we actually de-risking too aggressively when we're still going to draw income from, from an asset over a very long time period? Yeah, I mean, there's a number of issues there. We have to go to the specifics of how rapidly they are, they are de-risking. But I mean, to your first point, I don't think that retirement is a binary variable where I go from, you know, 100% working to 0% working. I mean, there are more and more people that are doing it part time. I think people want to retire slowly for psychological reasons. So this idea that, you know, you rapidly reduce the equity exposure and you go to bonds, 
problematic. I think that people are questioning that, like you are. People are questioning that, especially in light of the last few years. Can you imagine de-risking from equity and going to bonds in the last few years? What did that do to their wealth? Uh, you know, bonds didn't do very well uh, in 2022. Maybe they should have de-risked into cash, not into bonds. So there's a lot of thinking around that, and uh, it obviously depends on what career you're in and, and, and the point in the life cycle. But I do agree with you that the word de-risking has to be uh, unpacked a little bit more and examined more carefully. We got the first part right. You're young. You know, you might want to take a little bit more risk if your job is relatively secure. But at what point do we dial that back? I, I think that there's some normative aspects there that should be perfected. What I noticed is to sh there's a lot of debate in the market, like how do we help people get a better pension? And of course, it seems like contributing more is the obvious way, but that's very different for the, difficult for the industry to arrange. So I think a lot of people in the industry tend to suffer from what I call the savior syndrome. They think they can fix it by engaging with members and you know, get, get members to sort of realize the need to say more. And what do you think, is that a way forward when it comes to member experience? What's your experience from that? Yeah, so, you know, at, at some point when we're having a dialogue like this, I have to, you know, step back and say, look, this is an opinion of one person, not necessarily expert opinion based on scholarly research. I'm, I'm, just, guy, I'm just a guy at a bar now having a conversation with you. I, I think the industry is a little bit too paternalistic about this. You know, this is the right thing to do, so we're going to impose it. Uh, I, I also worry that uh, the reason uh, people aren't engaged, why aren't individuals engaged, why aren't they interacting with their pension, is because it's really, really boring. I mean, you know, I, I have teenage children, and I mean, you know, it's, it's just very, very difficult to have these conversations. It's just not interesting. Uh, I teach MBA students. They're slightly more interested. But uh, part of it is not just to engage with them or to make decisions for them or to default them. Make it interesting so that they want to pay attention to this because there's a lot of other competing things that are a hell of a lot more interesting than payout rates and contribution rates and annuitization rates and whether we default them into an annuity fund. So my, my summary would be make it interesting, not engaging. I think that's a very good takeaway we should bring to our people and colleagues who work in the marketing department in the industry because I think they're trying too much to educate instead of making it fun with pensions. Yeah. Um, although I don't have a great idea on how to make it fun, but Pioneer and Pension, I think, is fun. So let's shift the topic slightly. And, and because you have done a lot of work in Tom Teens. And in Pioneer and Pension, we have spoken to Richard Fulmer and Bonnie Jean McDonald on the topic. One of the people in the world who we associate with Tom Teens is you, Mosh. And you actually published the book, uh, How to Build a Modern Tontine in 22, which is in a sequel of, of work you did in 2017. Can you tell us what inspired you to look into tontines and when did you start to work on these instruments? Yeah, so, I mean, first of all, I want to apologize to many people that work in the uh, retirement income space that use a word other than tontine. You know, they'll use words like group self-annuitization, or uh, mortality pooling or longevity credit pooling. I mean, all of them are the same thing. It just seems like the word tontine has caught on as a catch-all phrase for everything. So I, I want to make it clear that, you know, tontines is really a word that's being used, not in its narrow historical sense, but it's this very broad category for things that are, are pooling at, at longevity risk. So you asked me a historical question. How did I get interested in this? How do you get interested in this? So when I was a graduate student in the 1990s, uh, I had to read a paper, an article as part of my studies. It's a very important article written by Professor Menahem Ya'ari, who is a very well-known scholar, uh, retired in Jerusalem. Uh, he wrote a paper in the 1960s that we were all required to read, where he talks about the life cycle model, which you just described. And he came up with a very interesting result. He made a prediction. His, his theory suggested that when people get to retirement, they should take all of their money, all of their money, and they should buy an annuity. 
This is known as the full annuitization result of Menachem Yari. That article has been cited thousands and thousands of times. And, you know, you will hear that word, the Yari result, mentioned over and over again. When I read that paper, and again, this is in the 1990s, I read the article and he says, and therefore people are going to turn their money. And I noticed that the instrument that he was describing there wasn't quite the annuity that you and I know. It wasn't something that was paying lifetime income at some future date. It wasn't something that promised an income for the rest of your life. That's not what Yari was talking about. He was describing something where you invest, and then in an instant from now, if somebody dies, you get their money, you and the rest of the pool. And then an instant later, if they die, uh, you know, you get more. And as people get older, there's going to be higher than that. I said, well, that doesn't sound like an annuity I'm familiar with. And I talked to some actuaries and insurance people. Again, this is in the 90s. And they said, yeah, we don't offer that kind of thing. That's a tontine and that's illegal. We, we, don't, we don't do that. We can't offer those things. And I said, that's very interesting because the article itself doesn't use the word tontine. I had not heard of that word. What are these things? And that got me, and we're talking 25 years ago, into sort of the mode of what are these things that everybody cites the Yari paper. The Yari paper claims to be talking about annuities, but my actuary people who I've just talked to, who I've described this to, said, no, that's a tontine. And that's where it all started. 25 years later, you Google tontine, and for some reason, my name comes up first. With, with most of the stuff, we bring up this very important point that you have a paper with a theory and then the industry sort of use it for its own purposes. And when you actually go back and look what's in there, you realize that's what wasn't it. When I was thinking about a tontine, for me, that's a way to sort of pull longevity in, in, in a good way. And today, when we have pay-as-you-go systems and we have demographic challenges, people are getting older and we don't have so much you know, new kids being born, do you think we will see states move away from a pay-as-you-go system into a sort of tontine version when it comes to the state pension? Yeah, so I, I am skeptical of uh, the word tontine being adopted as a state pension. You know, I, I, I don't see that word catching on, uh, but I do see tontine thinking catching on. In fact, it is the idea of, uh, you know, pooling mortality and longevity and and not having anything guaranteed, not necessarily uh, having something that pays for the rest of someone's life, uh, adding mortality credits. And in, in, in some sense, you know, uh, you may have heard that recently Royal Mail, uh, collective defined contribution in the UK. I mean, I wouldn't call it a tontine, but they're pooling, they're sharing, they're, they're, they have individuals that are not necessarily guaranteed anything. Uh, there are a number of Scandinavian plans that are, in essence, tontines. Uh, Tia Kref, you know, before I was born, they were offering payout annuities that if you talk to their actuaries, they'll say, well, we share, we pool, we participate. Eh, that's kind of a tontine as well. They might not call it that. Uh, in far, as far as your more general question, do I see countries doing that? You know, I'm actually seeing a movement almost in the other direction, uh, especially in Latin America, where I, I do a lot of work, where countries are sort of getting disillusioned with the idea of, you know, this private sector solution, D.C., buy annuities and retirement. And many of them are saying, no, maybe we should go back to pay go. So there's a struggle there. So I'm not sure if I'm answering your question because it's difficult to generalize. But the short answer would be taunting thinking is being implemented in pensions worldwide. Australia would be the best example. Tauntings with that name, that's pretty unique. You tend to find them only uh, right now in Canada. Yeah, and I would say I did some work up in Sweden for the premium pension looking into the future of that. And they, since start back in the year 2000, they do have longevity pooling built in there. And that's part, one part of the state pension. So yeah, I think it's a good way to have a funded pension and, and make sure that when you have an aging population, a pay-as-you-go system might actually become almost like a Ponzi scheme, right? When you have not the growing population base. So I'm quite worried if what you described in Latin America because they also are facing an aging population, perhaps even at a faster speed than we did in, in Europe. Look, these are long-term problems that uh, you know require a lot of sacrifices today. I, you know, I think an analogy to environmental work is is appropriate. You know, we're talking about things that are very far into the future. Yes, the population is aging, and in the year twenty sixty, this will be the problem. 
But right now I need to get elected and I need to get the majority of the population to pick me and telling them that, you know, 30 years from now, it requires some great oratory skills, some great convincing. Uh, it you know becomes a political issue as well. But let me repeat, yes, I am seeing a bit of a retreat from funding. Uh, and there are countries that are saying, eh, we don't know. You know, there is general... Uh, whether it's the OECD or the World Bank or the IMF advocating for funding in D.C. and so on. Uh, there's a strong PAYGO component. There's strong arguments that are still being made for PAYGO. And there are countries that are thinking, ah, maybe we went a little bit too far on the funded individual account side. And uh, it's it's not clear cut. It's not clear cut. I remember a long time ago, you mentioned TIA, CREF. I spoke with Brett Hammond when he was working there. And he explained the commercial challenge with selling annuities slash tontines or whatever we're going to call it he said they're very difficult to buy but those who actually bought it are very satisfied with it do you think that when when launching tontines and tontine like products that people have to pick themselves that they will face the same sort of annuity puzzle and be very difficult to sell in the market yeah well and in fact you mentioned the annuity puzzle which is a great segue from what i had said earlier the, the annuity puzzle comes from the fact it was coined by franco modigliani in his nobel prize speech but it comes from the fact that menachem Ari had shown the full annuitization result everybody should be buying annuities as quickly as possible uh, and yet people aren't uh and uh you know that's known as the annuity puzzle although i should point out and i think this is very important especially for the north american uh, component of this audience, that the annuities that we are talking about right now are life annuities, annuities that pay out an income for the rest of your life, single premium income annuities. Uh, those aren't as very popular, the annuity puzzle. But there is an enormous industry called the annuity industry, variable annuity, fixed indexed annuities, registered index linked annuity. I mean, these are hundreds of billions of dollars a year in premiums, a trillion in assets. Those are very, very successful products. They have an option to annuitize. Uh, they are legally defined as annuities because of insurance uh, regulations, insurance contracts. Uh, so anybody listening that says, what do you mean nobody buys annuities? We've had our best year ever. And so, so the word annuity puzzle has to be almost stated with the annuity puzzle relates to uh, life annuities. But I certainly agree with Brett's comments. I, I know him and, you know, I spent some time at Tia Kref. In fact, I was an actuarial intern there when I was an undergraduate in New York. That's where I actually learned what an annuity was. I did not know what the word annuity was until I spent a summer working at Tia Kref. And they said, what do you mean? That's what we sell here. How can you not know what these things are? And I was in my 20s. Uh, yes, they are very popular for people that own them. Very few people are unhappy with their monthly income. My mother's a good example of it. I finally convinced her to get an annuity. She didn't like the idea. Uh, now she owns one. She's very happy with her monthly income. We had a previous guest, Arun uh, Muralidhar. He has a question for you. And instead of me repeating that question, let's roll the tape. How can you justify the pricing of annuities if the concept of a retirement security bond doesn't exist for insurance companies to hedge their risk out? especially drill or inflation indexed annuities, life annuities? I mean, first of all, the existence of real annuities in the U.S. where I'm based or in North America where I'm based uh, is extremely rare. Uh, in fact, I think the last insurance company that sold a real inflation adjusted annuity, not COLA, uh, closed shop about a year or two ago. Uh, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to unpack that. I, I don't think that insurance companies hedge annuities as much as use the law of large numbers to sell a lot of them so that they get rid of idiosyncratic risk. Uh, many insurance companies take the other side uh, of the bet by having life insurance. I mean, when you, if you think about it, if you're selling an annuity, you worry uh, about the fact about two things. Uh, number one, you worry that that individual right there is going to live a very, very long time and you have to pay her for a very long time. So you get rid of that risk by selling a lot of them, law of large numbers. There's another risk, and that is that you get the probabilities wrong and not just that individual lives a long time. All the people that you're selling annuities to, that mortality table was wrong. People are living longer. The mortality rates are lower. And you can hedge that uh, by selling life insurance. I know some companies that keep track of that very well. And they say, well, but if people end up living a long time, then we don't have to pay as much on our term insurance business. And that's a natural hedge. Uh, so maybe in that context, hedge. 
So Arun, I apologize if I'm not answering your question and if I'm rambling, but uh, I certainly agree with you that, you know, the process of hedging annuities uh, is something that, uh, you know, is, is, is not easy. You don't just sell a bunch of them. That's a good answer. And, and Arun, I hope you're listening and, and, uh, and, and it satisfies your, your curiosity. I, I now want to move from the theory into the more practical side of it. And I know that you're involved in a firm called Guardian Capital, where, where you have developed on team solutions that are actively sold in the market. Can you tell us a bit on how you took this tontine idea and took it from an idea and actually make it into practice? You know, once again, so first of all, I, I, there's a limit as to, uh, you know, the details that I can discuss. Obviously, Garden's a publicly traded company, so I, you know, I can't disclose anything that's not publicly available. So I can give you sort of a bird's eye view. Uh, number two, uh, as I've said many times, it's very important to give credit where credit is due. Too many people run around these days and say, oh, I invented everything. And, you know, I uh, was one of a member of a team that helped develop this Taun team that was launched last year. And uh, the history there is about two or three years ago, uh, one of the uh, directors of the company, his name is uh, Barry Gordon, deserves the credit. He called me up. I was at the university. This was in the uh, early 2020s, just before the pandemic. And he said to me, you know, Mosh, uh, we've never met before, but I really want you to come and help us at Guardian uh, introduce two new mutual funds. We're about to launch two new mutual funds in Canada. And my reaction was somewhat skeptical. I said, why does Canada need two new mutual funds? Uh, I think we have way too many mutual funds in Canada, thousands of mutual funds. Why do we need more mutual funds? If anything, let's get rid of a couple of hundred mutual funds. That I'd be glad to help with. And his response is, no, we want to introduce two mutual funds that are very, very different, unique. And you know, he described them to me. He said, one mutual fund, he said to me, is going to pay out money. And after a number of years, after 20 years, it'll run out of money. It'll run out of money. We will pay out for money and we will take the net asset value to zero at the end of the 20 years, which sounded weird to me because I thought people want income for life. Why would they only want it for 20 years? I know that's odd. Usually you don't want to run out of money. You're creating a fund that will run out of money. He said, yes. And I said, but what happens if people live for 20 years? What are they supposed to do? They just ran out of money. And he said, oh, we're introducing another fund and that other fund will give you a large sum of money. Uh, at the end of the 20 years, if you survived, so that's a separate fund. If you survive 20 years, you'll get the sum of money in that fund together with all the people that survived 20 years. And I said, that sounds like a tontine. And he said, absolutely. Do you want to help us? I said, yeah, this sounds fascinating. I've been fascinated by these things. So that's sort of what the genesis of this was. And, you know, over the number of years, it was about getting regulators comfortable with this, getting marketing people comfortable with this, getting the public, the financial advisors, the intermediaries, getting the parameters, uh, you know, aligned. How much uh, does this fund that's going to ruin in 20 years pay out? Uh, what can you expect at the end of 20 years if you do survive? What's a reasonable mortality distribution in 20 years? What's a reasonable investment distribution? How do you invest the funds in the Tontine portion? Do you just buy an index fund? That might not make a lot of sense because mortality does have some correlation to the stock market. You might want to think strategically in terms of the sectors you're going into. So these were all of the things that we had to contend with and deal with. And after about a two-year period uh, of, you know, me being engaged with them on this and providing input and, you know, helping with some of the research there, uh, they launched this in uh, the, uh, you know, end of last year. And, uh, you know, from the beginning, I said, look, if you want me involved with this, you got to call it a taunting. You got to call it a taunting because that's exactly what this is. And they tested it and it seemed to work well. So I'm not sure if I'm providing, you know, an answer to your question, but that's the genesis of it. And it was very satisfying to get this done. And it's now out there uh, and available. But unfortunately, I can't invest in it because I am too young. The cohort that was selected for it uh, was older, 60 to 65. So I'm hoping they launch another cohort soon so that I can get into it. But uh, that's sort of the, the, the big picture. Very good. And you said there were two mutual funds can you explain what sort of the the difference between the two right so right. without uh, a whiteboard and slides and and you know a, a lot of diagrams here think of two completely different mutual funds one mutual fund you put a hundred dollars in 
They invested in a portfolio and every year they send you, you know, eight dollars, a hundred dollars or a hundred euros and eight year they send you eight euros. And over time they adjust that payment, perhaps up, perhaps down, so that at the end of 20 years, there's absolutely nothing left in the account. Uh, a systematic withdrawal plan that deliberately runs out of money in 20 years. That's design number one. Why would you want to run out of money in 20 years? Because you want to have the highest possible standard of living for those 20 years without having to worry about what happens afterwards. So that's fund number one. There's absolutely no longevity pooling. There's no taunting element. And there is no uh, you know, mortality component at all. It's fully liquid. You can do whatever you want. That's the first one. Okay. And by the way, I uh, have been reminded by the attorneys and the legal folks that what I'm doing now is not selling a security. I am describing the economics of the security. Very important to point that out. That's fund number one. Fund number two has quite a lot of longevity pooling. It's not going to be as liquid because we can't have people leave. Uh, and that fund is going to invest. And the idea is it provides nothing for the next 20 years. You get no income at all. But that pool grows over time and survivors end up being subsidized by those who don't survive. And the, at the end of 20 years, you get that pool of money waiting for you there because that other fund has run out of money. What do you do with that pool of money 20 years from now? Anything you want. Uh, think of it as you're 65 and now you're 85. You have that pool of money. You could go out and decide at 85 that you've had enough fun. You don't want to travel anymore. You give it all to the grandkids. Or you can decide at the age of 85 that you would like to buy a boat. Or you can decide at 85 you need it for health care. Or you can buy an annuity. That's We don't want to do that. And uh, that obviously is the, the issue of an insurance company. If I can provide one other explanation here, I see we're running short on time. The idea of this fund was to disentangle two ingredients that are inside a life annuity. This is the way I explain it from a, you know, a chemical perspective. A life annuity consists of two things that people often confuse. One is a guarantee to pay you an income for as long as you live. I don't need an insurance company for that. I can buy a bunch of bonds that'll do it. Arun and Professor Merton's selfies, in theory, could do that. Buy a portfolio that pays you income for the next 50 years. I'm sure it'll last for the rest of your life if you are 80 years old. There's no way you're making it to 130. That'll pay you for as long as you live. Fixed income. That's one component. The other component is the mortality pooling. The reason insurance companies can pay more than what I'm calling the portfolio of strip bonds is because they're pooling mortality risk. They'll get you more than the yield on that portfolio of bonds. Why? Because of pooling mortality risk. The idea with this fund was to disentangle those two. Can we give people mortality credits without a guarantee of something for the rest of their lives? And people are listening, will hear, yeah, isn't that sort of actuarial notes in the Ari article? Exactly. That was the idea, to bring to life something that existed in theory since the 1960s and say, yes, that product is actually available. It's actuarial notes with mortality credits. I have no idea if I've entirely lost you and my audience, but there it is. That's what we were trying to do. I think our audience are professional pension nerds. So... I think what I see from the comments is you haven't lost them. They're all fired up. And I was wondering one question when you've been doing this work and, and you know, ask what, you know, answer what you can, but what were the things you expected to be difficult, but maybe weren't? And what are the things that you said, wow, this was a challenge I never thought of in the process of going from idea to product? Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a case study. Um, which hasn't been written yet. I, I would say that one of the challenges that I did not anticipate was talking to uh, the legal people, the compliance people, the attorneys, uh, the regulators, uh, talking to people that don't speak Greek. And what I mean by that is the world that I'm surrounded with in academia the people I teach, the CFAs and the MBAs and, and certainly the PhDs and my graduates, we all speak a language called Greek, which is the language of mathematics. And I can explain things to them very, very quickly because I write down an equation. And I say, no, we're trying to do this is the payout. This is the expectation. This is the discounting. This is the probability. Boom, we're done. And, and there's the PDE. And if you solve that PDE, there's your value. You can't do that with the vast majority of the world. So I had to learn how to explain things with my hands tied behind my back for about six hours at a time. 
Like, you know, you can't, you can't use that. Can't, no, no whiteboard, Moshe. You cannot use the whiteboard. Explain. I mean, that, that, that becomes a challenge because we're not used to that. As you pointed out, everybody in the audience are pension folks, so we can use a certain language. Imagine having to explain this to people that just don't have the background. And their initial reaction is, is that you're bamboozling them. Yeah, you're just hiding. You're obfuscating. That's what you're I don't understand because you're trying to hide something as opposed to, oh, there's a common language. That was something that was, uh, that was a challenge. Uh, and that took time to overcome. I think uh, just explaining some of these concepts, getting people comfortable with something that hasn't existed before. But that was certainly one of them. And that's why I was glad that the folks at, uh, at Guardian had you know, a lot of you know, very good attorneys involved and legal folks and outside counsel and people that engaged with the, the uh, you know, regulators to get them comfortable with it. At some point, they stopped inviting me to those meetings. It was like, no, no he's making it worse. He's, he's talking too complicated. So tell him to stay home this time. But anyway, that was one of the... One of the many challenges. It was a lot of fun. Don't get me wrong. Uh, leaving the ivory tower to do these projects uh, gives me a lot of energy and gives me a lot of great ideas. Because then I come back and I say, "Hey, here's an interesting math problem that just came from an industry." So that's sort of the the essence of it. Very good. I think we should open up now to questions from the audience, and I have a couple of them here in the chat. So the first one is from David. It says, "Much of the market in the U.S. uses target date funds." to de-risk, and in the UK, we tend to favor life cycling. In your view, is one superior to the other, or it doesn't matter? You know, so you know, these are one of the types of questions where you really need to know a little bit more specifics about you know, what is the equity exposure in the target date versus the life cycle. Um, I'm, I'm, let me step back a bit and, 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 and change the conversation just a little bit to help answer the question. I'm not evading uh, the answer. You know, I, I'm becoming more and more skeptical of chronological age as a measure of anything that matters in, in you know, portfolio and life cycle investing. My chronological age uh, might be 55. That's the number of times I've circled the sun. But I have something called a biological age, and you have a biological age. And a biological age is a measure of how old you really are. And modern science technology uh, is now giving people very good estimates of how old they are biologically, whether you use a telomere length, the end of the chromosomes, whether you use other biomarkers, Horvath clock, DNA methylation. I can go on and on on this. I had myself tested a couple of years ago. I'm glad that my biological age is about seven years, eight years less than my chronological age. What's my point here? I'm not showing off that I'm healthier or younger. What I'm trying to say is that I don't want an investment policy geared to my chronological age. I want it geared to my biological age because that really is a better indication of how long I'm going to live. So target date or life cycle, if you're using my chronological age, I think that's going to be an issue and the dispersion is great. That's number one. Number two, the industry in which I work, I think is very important. And I think that target date or life cycle that's focused on an equity exposure, risk as a one-dimensional asset is problematic. Because if I work at Coca-Cola, my exposure to financials is very different than if I work at Russell Investments. Uh, and, and I need a 401k that adjusts for that or a DC plan that adjusts for that. So I have no idea, once again, if I've answered the question, but I do think that uh, we have to think a little bit more about what age means in the context of investments. I think sir, that's very insightful, Mosh. And I think the question here is more like, there's like two ways of doing de-risking. You can either put it in a target date fund or you can have a life cycle approach. I think the answer is, is tomato tomato discussion. So yeah, it basically depends on how you de-risk basically. The idea that I can pick a date and say, well, you know, I'm going to retire in 2072. I don't know. I'm not quite sure what the world's going to look like. I, I do like the idea of reduced exposure to equity over time. And sometimes this is just marketing. You know, it's like, is it Coke or is it Pepsi? Kind of tastes the same to me. I can't tell the difference. Thank you. And there's another question here from David as well. He he goes back to, you say, make it interesting and not engage, trying to engage people. Have you seen examples where this has been done successfully? And then, you know, how was it done? Yeah, so I, I think that the answer there is I have. I, I've been blown away by some of the gamification attempts. I don't know if that's a word, but I've heard that used a lot. Gamification is the process of turning financial planning into a game. Not in a game sense of you don't treat it seriously. Oh, this is not serious. It's a game. In the sense of you make it as a, you know, like the game of life simulations that some people play, board games. 
you, you make the allocation decisions. You make this style something that's just interesting in a you know way that entertains. You know, video games are extraordinarily popular. Turn the process of uh, picking your you know four hundred one k asset allocation or defaulting or into some sort of game. Uh, insurance turn it into some sort of game again in the entertaining sense. We the biggest risk I and, and this is something I've heard from someone. The biggest risk we face. Uh, in this, you know, getting people interested in their own personal finance isn't necessarily the literacy or the illiteracy of the individual. It's the boredom of the individual. You know, it, it's not whether they're literate or not. Just, you got to keep them interested. So I have seen examples. And the examples are you go on to the website of the plan provider and they've made this some kind of a game and move the tokens. And if you put it here, try to win by doing this. Oh, look at that. If I put it all in cash, I always lose. Huh. Why am I always losing when I'm putting my chips in cash? Well, because they just don't grow and, and something like that. Game, gamification. I, I remember when I, I had a colleague and he was writing about the annuity puzzle and he created a sort of experiment where you could sort of do it a second time. So first you run a simulation and see what happened and then you could change your strategy for the second time. And for people who actually lived long, they started to realize, hmm, I could live long. Maybe I should think more about having a pooling of, of longevity. So I think it is, yeah. you know, you get only one life and, you know, if you live longer than you expected, well, you're in trouble. You're not going to be able to repeat that game. There's another question here from David. I think we have an audience where, where a lot of people were called David because it's different family names. So it's not the same David pushing question and question. He says, can master trust offer tontines? And, and, you know, this is a very UK-centric question, so I'm going to answer it. Technically not, uh, because it's a money purchasing scheme. You need to have an FCA regulation. Hopefully with the new CDC regulation, they will take that into account. Uh, I wrote something about it in the response to DWP. Yeah, that's something we faced here where DC plans were asking, can they put the tontines inside? And because there is no lifetime income component, it's just mortality credits, uh, it did fall under the mutual fund uh, regulation and they were able to put it inside. So I think the tauntings that you're referring to is a lifetime income. Uh, if you simply focus on a terminal horizon and say that's when we're going to split the money, uh, it might be easier. So my suggestion would be maybe it's change the product a little bit as opposed to forcing through the existing product. But like I said, I don't know the specifics of the UK regulation. Thank you. That was a very good comment. Here's another David. He says, Mosh makes it all both interesting and engaging. My question, why are the Canadian temp teams not taking off? They don't appear to be gaining much traction in the market, notwithstanding the marketing behind them. Thank you. So, I mean, I don't think that it's, it's early enough to really tell. Uh, you know, I don't think people appreciate how long it takes for some of these financial innovations to actually succeed. Uh, you know, the first ETF, uh, and as a, you know, a Canadian, I can tell you, they were offered in the early 1990s in Canada. The Toronto Stock Exchange was the first one. But ETFs really didn't become, take over the public consciousness uh, until 15 or 20 years later. So I, I think it's very early to declare they're not taking off. Uh, and there is money that's going in. You have to remember that these are uh, limited age groups. These are new products. Uh, we're talking about retirees that may or may not be comfortable uh, with it. So, uh, you know, if in three or four years from now, very, very few sales, then, uh, you know, maybe it's time to declare that uh, these things don't work. But I, I, I want to make it very clear that if you think the annuity puzzle is a barrier to getting people to buy annuities, I mean, the taunting situation where it's pure survival credits uh, might make it even worse, which is why there's a refund component and uh, engagement. There's also, you have to understand, an intermediary involved here as well. So there's an individual. There's the manufacturer and then there's the intermediary in between that has to be convinced. Yeah, I think I'm going to put this in front of my client. So that's an educational process. Uh, so, I, I, again, I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but I think it's a bit too early to sit back and say, yeah, nobody's downloaded the app in three weeks. So time to shut it down. I think it's a good analogy and uh, it's going to take time. And as you said, it's not just the product, it's distribution and the uh, middle layers who has to love it too. Because the difficulty with finance, it is not like selling a Coke or a, or a Pepsi. 
it's a more difficult buy for for people. So I I measure success differently. You know, a firm obviously measures success in terms of uh, sales or revenue or you know assets under management or assets under administration. You know, has this changed the way people think about retirement income provision? Are we influencing the way people think about what they do at retirement? And I think that these campaigns and these products and the existence of these products, the ability of someone in, uh, you know, Belgium to point to Canada or Australia for that matter and say, see, it worked there. You know, so then suddenly the legislatures feel more comfortable with it. So that three years from now, you may see some EU directive that you're like, wow, they allowed this. Yeah, because three years ago, somebody told them that this is something that they should consider. I mean, these are extraordinarily long-lived ideas that take time to implement. You know, indexing was around since Sharp proposed it or Markowitz proposed it. So give us a bit more time, please, is what I would say. Time is going to be the judge. Uh, There's a question here from from another David. Uh, What is the rate on a team that invests in government bonds versus a conventional annuity? So basically, if you skip all this insurance... uh, how would you say, uh, charges, etc. You need to have an insurance company offer a, more or less a guarantee. Uh, how much better does it become? How much more user-friendly is it? Yeah. So instead of you know suggesting a number, uh, I will start by saying that I was asked that exact question that David number seven asked uh, by the Society of Actuaries about five years ago, the U.S. Society of Actuaries. And I did a report for them together with Two colleagues of mine at uh, York University, Tom Salisbury, who I've been writing with for many, many years, uh, as well as a, one a graduate student. Anyway, we looked at exactly that question. We said, well, you know, would these things pay more than annuities? And we got data on annuity payouts historically uh, from a company called Canex Financial in Canada that has a history of all the annuities. And for the Tontine, uh, lifetime income Tontine, uh, we sort of modeled what mortality would look like in terms of uh, payouts and how that would be adjusted. And it, the answer is it obviously depends on the age at which you enter into this. Uh, it obviously depends on the assets in which the Tontine uh, are invested in. But if you want a number, if you want that Twitter summary, what's the number? It's about 15, possibly even 20% more uh, than the annuity would provide at that age for the lifetime income Tontine because, as Stefan pointed out, Uh, The capital requirements, the reserve requirements, uh, obviously, because of the fact that, uh, you know, you're not guaranteeing anything. There's no guarantee. Remember that if you live a long time and everybody else lives a long time, your payout will go down. So, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons I think Tia Kref is a bit more aggressive in terms of its pricing compared to others, possibly because of the fact that to a certain extent, not everything is guaranteed. They could reduce it. Hopefully, I didn't get myself into trouble there. But the short answer is, yes, it pays more. Yeah, that's very good to hear. And I think sometimes you want to have security and safety. And when you then add regulatory charges on top of it, all of a sudden, it eats up all, all the, a lot of the good stuff. Uh, there's another question here from David. We have like a David uh, triple or quadruple uh, <laughs> attendees. Uh, it says... How do you determine what to put into the 20-year mutual fund and into the Tontine fund if the idea is to provide a lifetime of income? So how much do you allocate to the two of them? Yeah. Look, I, I, I will at some point say, you know, there's an enormous amount of literature on that company's website that you can take a look at, and they give suggestions on what the breakdown should be, and it's a budgeting exercise. You know, here are some factors instead of giving you an actual percentage. You know, if you have a great pension already, and some people do, a lot of people do. I have a great pension. If I have a great pension, I don't need as much of a longevity hedge. So I might actually want to put more into the drawdown fund because I want to enjoy myself between the ages of 65 and 85. I want to travel and have fun and spend it. At 85, I not may not be as mobile, so you know I won't put as much there. On the other hand, if you have absolutely no guaranteed lifetime pension, you're you know invested in uh, you know a DC money purchase plan, you might want to put more. You know this is where you want to discuss this with a financial advisor. You want to take a look at you know the calculators and see what it would look like. Uh, it's a personal exercise. It's like how much insurance should you buy? How much life insurance should you have? Right. I mean, that, that's a, a similar question. How much uh, term life insurance should you have? Uh, if you ask an insurance agent, if you ask an insurance, how much insurance should I have? You know what the answer will be? More. 
more, whatever you have, more. So, you know, you have to understand that, you know, who you're talking to is going to influence it. The short answer is it's a personal exercise trading off consumption today versus consumption in the future. And everybody has their own subjective discount rate for what they prefer. When you think in the UK, it's quite common, you know, you have the people who have a, a good savings pot, they have enough money to, to think really careful and hard on, on how to create a lifelong income and use longevity pooling in a good way. But then you have a lot of people who only have been saving for a relatively short period since out enrollment, or they may actually retire on a relatively small pot, say 50,000 pounds. How much should you think about the here and now? So the next couple of years, how much should you think about having an income in the future? And also when you know that in, in, in for example, UK, you do have a decent state pension and you do have some, you know, health care is through the NHS and other parts of the social security system is there. How do you deal with pension when you don't have enough to buy sort of a, a solid? Uh, yeah, so uh, I, I might have lost the last uh, tail end of that question there, but you know there are a very large group of people that uh, simply do not need more pension income. They're over pensionized. They, they already have the guarantees. They have the lifetime income. Perhaps they have a state pension. Uh, you're now talking about people that have nothing. They don't have a state pension. They don't have, they have no money. I mean, I, I just think you're dealing with a different social strata. You're certainly different dealing with different problems. I, I don't think it's high on their list, lifetime income. You know, if that's the situation you're in, that's your socioeconomic status. You have nothing. You have absolutely nothing. I don't really think you're sitting at the age of 65 and saying, gee, now what do I do if I had 97? I think there are other issues that are more burning. We should make it easier for people to buy smaller sums, you know, like a post office approach. Right? You go in and you you give them fifty cents and you get a little bit of an annuity. Uh, I uh, I actually bought, you know, I own one of those. I bought a deferred income annuity, uh, otherwise known as an ALDA, that enables me to purchase it in small amounts. You know, I can put as little as a hundred dollars into one of these things. Maybe that's what we have to make more popular and easy for people to do, to take small sums and, you know, on a regular basis, add to it. Maybe when you're, you know, checking out at the bank or at the grocery store, you know, would you like to contribute another dollar to the Red Cross? Sure. Why not? Would you like to contribute a dollar to your lifetime annuity? Sure. Let's do that as well. Maybe that's the way to do it. So the answer to your question is we should make it easier for people to buy very small amounts uh, in any point in time, if it's appropriate for them, given all the other risks that they face in their life. In, in many countries, you do have a decent sort of social security safety net. So um, if you don't have a lot of pension, you probably have to think about when can I have the most fun of the money I do have at which part in my life. And when you're getting really old, you're probably going to be less mobile, traveling less, so maybe the, no, the state pension might be sufficient. You have been answering a lot of our questions, and I think now it's actually time for you to ask our next uh, guest your question. And our next guest is Catherine Riley. She will come here on May 25 to Pioneer Pensions, and we will discuss a lot about DC design in practice. So she's been working at State Street, helping a lot of schemes, developing the DC scheme. So basically looking at it from the practical side. So what question do you, Mosh, want to ask Catherine? Well, that's interesting, uh, especially given uh, Catherine's State Street experience. Uh, what I would like to know more about, and I hope your audience would like to know more about, uh, is the ESG debate that's taking place right now environmental, social, and governance. What are her thoughts on how this is changing her business, whether it's investment allocation, whether it's dealing with the political environment, to talk a little bit about how ESG affects the process of design in the DC world? That would be my question. With that, I would like to thank you very much, Mosh, for coming. It's been a pleasure having you here. And as people in the audience said, it's very engaging to, to listen and discuss with you, and I fully agree with that. And I also would like to thank everyone in the audience for coming here and joining in and asking your questions. I hope to see you next time. And, but until then, a big thank you to you, Mosh, and, and hope to speak to you soon.